Wood Christian Fellowship's weekly podcast. Hope you really enjoy today's sermon and I hope it really blesses you. Hey, would you grab your Bibles today and look for the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 and we're reading verse 4. It says this, Ephesians 6 verse 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. And it's like we could repeat the word again, fathers. Fathers, instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. You know, God here, he's, he's speaking right into the hearts of fathers. And he's saying, fathers, come on, you can do it. And, you know, as I speak this morning, I, I got a couple of different parts. My, my sermon is in two segments. The first segment, I'm going to talk all about my father, my own father, you know. And uh, as I start to rave about my dad, as I start to tell stories of his goodness and his investment in my life, what I want you to do as I want to think, think on your own father. I want you to think on people who were a father to you. You know, people who've spoken to your life. And I want you to think on your own fathering, how it's going, and who you invest into as a father. Just hold on the, the juicy parts of the stories and, and think of your own as, as I talk about this. My dad, his name is Norm Short. He's 67 years old, and uh, he's just crazy in love with my mum. You know, we stayed there last week, and you walk past their bedroom door in the morning, ah, they're all cuddled up all over each other, you know, in bed. Yeah, and it's always been like that. they just close like this. And uh, for, for, for work, my dad is uh, an electrical inspector, so if there was a new building over here, he'd come and he'd put the new meters on the board. And uh, so that's what he does. He runs around uh, in his little, uh, in his RAV4, and he's disconnecting power, and he's putting it on and stuff like that. I remember driving down the road with my dad when we were young, and there's the talk that goes on in the car. Those are very significant times. So think of your own family. There's kids in the back, and the talk is going on. And I remember the subject of drugs. Big, bad drug subject come up. And you could hear my father's opinion on drugs. He would say, you kids, drugs are bad, real bad. You could hear it, real bad. You know, he said, stay away from drugs. He said, they addictive. You see, you only got to try it once and then you're into this cycle. And then he would tell stories. And, and you could tell... At that moment of time, he was investing in the two boys sitting in that back seat of that HQ Holden. Drugs, bad. And we knew, and right till today, I know, drugs, bad. Anytime I'm around drugs, I walk into a scene, there's drugs, it goes, bad. But you know where it got invested in my life? Dad. He fathered me. And you can father people around you when, when, you, when you speak about things like this. I remember any time there was a policeman, any time, and he was within range of us, my dad said, come on, boys. And he'd have us over there, and he'd have us shaking the hand of the policeman, and he's saying, policeman, good. And he's just, he's just weaving that into the fabric of our lives. If we were at a country fair, Chartwell Square in Hamilton, wherever it was, and there's a policeman We'd be over there shaking his hand, and Dad's, and we walk away. Dad say, "He's a good guy. If you ever need help, you go see that guy. He'll help you. If you're lost, you go find that guy. He'll get you back to me." Can you see that he was he was fathering? He was investing who you can trust in life. Uh, you ask my boys and girls. My dad is still the same. If you go for a walk down the street, 
Granddad stops, my father, he stops, and he talks to all the strangers. I remember we used to walk a lot, you know, and, uh, and he would stop and speak to everyone to the point where, oh, I'm sort of wriggling in my pants, you know. He's just, he's just engaging. We'll be sitting in Debrett's hot pools, and he's engaging the stranger or the person from another nation, or he's just reaching out to them, and he's just so friendly, uh, nothing to hide, and just engaging the stranger, you know, and that's my dad, friendly plus. And I know it, uh, even Elijah now, he's kind of embarrassed. Granddad's talking to strangers all the time. But that was my father. My father, he knows how to relax. It's nothing to see him leaning back on the couch just at the end of a working day. The television goes on and he's not going to die of no heart attack, man. He, he knows how to relax. When it's time off, the boat is off the mooring and whew, he's cutting it through Lake Taupo. And he has always been like that. My granddad's mum, which I knew well, grandma, she was just the same, you know. See, they weren't stressing over nothing. They just were calm. I remember um, racism came up at the table one day. We are talking about Ah, oh, the, the Chinese are coming to New Zealand, this and that and that. And I remember Dad speaking, racism is wrong. And you went, we all went, Phew. yep, yeah, yeah, that's right, racism is wrong. And it never went past that day. Never was there a day again in that, in that household where racism was spoken of down with them. It was cut at its root. He fathered us on that subject right there. Racism was wrong. I remember I was a mechanic, and in the mechanics uh, workshop, in the smoker room, man, that thing is a pit from hell often. The talk that's going on, and flipping them, and that race of people, and that. And I sat in those smoker rooms, and never once, never once did I enter into any of that conversation, because my dad had fathered me. He had invested that principle in my life. Racism, wrong. I never had a double thought on it after the day he taught me that. My dad's nerves are as cold as ice. It was April the 22nd, okay? I was 14 years old, and I'm going to be 15 on July the 17th of the same year. And I've been hounding my dad Dad, teach me to drive. Teach me to drive. And Don, my brother's two years old. I say, he's been driving, you know. And so my dad, he goes, all right, I'll teach you on my birthday. You know Control Gate Hill in Taupo? You're leaving Taupo. You're going up that big hill, double laner on the left off Rotorua. April the 22nd, the HR Holden station wagon. He pulls up. He hops out. Walks around, I slide across the bench seat into the driver's seat. Three speed hold off. It was like a million bucks, you know. And uh, turns the key. This is control gate hell. See, we're going to learn. Let's learn. Run. Put the clutch in. I've been watching for months how to drive. Clutch in. You know, jerk, jerk, jerk. You know, bunny hop. After all. I remember the hardest thing was knowing where the left side of a six-foot car is. You know, Holden's a wide and big and heavy thing, big bonnet. It's not like a Jap car, you know. And, uh, and he's going, just keep left. You know, all he's going, just stay left. You know, we go up there, we go up poor happy road. And I remember those days. And he, he didn't panic. He wasn't holding a handbrake. He was just cool as ice. And, and his fathering, there, there was just nothing that shook him. He was just patient, you know. We had this Ford Transit van. If you know anything about Ford Transits, they are just underpowered. They just wouldn't pull a skin off a rice pudding. V4 in the front, they were pathetic, you know. It was a motorhome, our first motorhome as a family. Now, I'm an apprentice mechanic doing why, uh, why I don't know how you say the name, why, why Ricky, why Ricky Polytech in Rotorua, and I'm serving, and um, over here, and I say, Dad, we should, we should put a V8 in this thing. He's going, 
Yeah, 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 we should. So we get in the car, we drive to Matta Matta Auto Spares, and they are Jap- they're importing all these motors by container. We go through and we, we choose a motor, we tie it down on the trailer. And I remember being in the shed, we washed that thing and we cleaned it and we, we got it bored out and we put brand new pistons in that thing, you know. And then I remember being lying underneath the Ford Transit on the ground and we had an angle grinder, you know, and we're cutting the floor out. We cut this big section where the V8 was going to sit right between mum and dad right in the front there, you know. And I remember the sparks flying, we were welding stuff. And I just remember that companionship at 18. At 18, I'm with my dad. We're lying underneath. We're putting a 302 Windsor in a transit van. And it's just, yeah, this is so cool. I remember the same van. I remember the paint was bad. And so dad said, let's spray the thing. I said, oh, I don't know how to spray a van. He said, oh, we'll, we'll work it out. I remember we got the spray gun and we're, psh, psh, we're spraying. And we had it all masked. And it was so ridiculous that the runs were in big long lines and just dripping down the side of the van. And we were in stitches. We were like two giggling girls just laughing at the runs, rolling down the side. It was just ridiculous, you know. But I still remember the day that we were just laughing about it. Let's go back to that V8 engine. I said to Dad, look at the wear on those camshafts in there. Look, that's, it's worn, you know. But you know, there's something about my dad. He was non-perfectionist. And uh, you'll see it in my leadership here. Non-fine detail. It's just my dad all over. If he goes to a, a job and it's a legal job and you've got to do this and you're not like that, as long as they're going to do it tomorrow, he'll sign it off, you know? And he's an electrical inspector, you know? We look in the valley of this camshaft and it's worn on the lobes. And I'm going, it's not good enough, Dad. We need a new one. He's going, ah... Just put it back together. It'll be fine. If it's too bad, we'll pull it apart again. You know what? He was right. It ran beautiful with that old camshaft in there. You didn't need a new... And he knew it and I didn't. And he was more laid back in life. And I was more, bam, bam, bam. We've got to get it perfect, you know? But I was learning stuff in those days. The same HR Holden station wagon we were learning to drive in, he hand-painted it with a, with a house paintbrush, wide one. Red and white. Don and I are going, Dad, it looks terrible. He goes, it's good enough. You know? But he was fathering me because I wasn't created to be a perfectionist. You know? And I took it through into life and it set me free the way he fathered me on that perfectionist or just, it's okay, it's good enough. And in life there sometimes needs to be, yeah, it's good enough. I remember my dad, he could fix anything, anything. I remember the Corolla blew a head gasket. Yeah, he was no mechanic. He pulled the head off, and I remember sitting on the front porch at 43 Taupin View Road with one of those valve things, and he's lapping in the valves, and he's doing it himself. I remember the washing machine broke down. It was one of those, like those 380 things, you know, with a concrete slab in the bottom. He's there. He fixed it himself. He's just like that. I remember... When I was at school playing hockey, I cracked my hockey stick. I take it home. My dad was a boaty, right? So he takes it. He's always got lots of fiberglass. Man, he just like fiberglass wrapped that thing, taped it and painted it and brought it home from work. And I had the only fiberglass wrapped hockey stick at school, you know, with the lump in it, you know. I was kind of embarrassed about it at the time. But, you know, now as I look back, that was my father. His, his love was just pouring out all over me as he was repairing that hockey stick, you know. He worked at Fletcher Wood Panels. We moved from Cambridge at uh, age 8 or 10, somewhere there. I think it was 10. It was 10. And then we moved to Cambridge. From, from Cambridge, we moved to Taupo. Dad's a boaty, beautiful lake. Fletcher Wood Panels got a job. Now, he used to take stuff to Fletcher Wood Panels. He's an electrician, so he's a shift worker. And so he used to take stuff to fix when it's quiet out there, you know. Well, we went out to dinner with one of mum's friends, I think it was, and, and the boys were looking under the house, you know. It's a house on poles. We find this motorcycle. Like, we didn't have motorbikes as a family, and uh, we find this 80cc 
Italian motorcycle under the shed, but it's all in a box. I mean, it's like everything's in a box. The gears are all, oh, it's just a mess. No one would even endeavor to put it back together. It's just a mission, you know? And I, I remember saying to the, to the man, can we have it? Can we have it? You know, I'm begging. I'm begging as like a 12-year-old boy. Sir, can, can we have it? You know, and he's going, only if your dad says yes. Father says, yeah, you can have it. And I remember him taking those pieces together and off to Fletch Wood Panels he went. And then one day, one special day, he come home and he put it on. He put it on the, the bench in the shed and he had that engine assembled up. He got it. It wasn't quite perfect, but that was us all over, you know. Kind of gears didn't work kind of right. But, you know, there it was, I remember, slotting it into the frame. You know, you know the school reports that come from school? Mine would say, when Rex finds things that he's good at, uh, he puts his head, and all the rest was bad, you know. When I was like, fixing motorbikes, I remember going home from school on my bicycle every lunch hour and fixing that same motorcycle, just getting it right. And, you know, I just remember my dad, he could fix anything. I remember family Holidays. I don't even, I tried to look this up on Google the other day. It's called Stillwaters. It's up in Auckland somewhere, Silverdale. And we used to go to family holidays together. It was tenting. And the things I remember are things like this. Bingo nights. We're just little tackers, man. And, and, and there's bingo and the parents are playing bingo. And the kids about this age or a little bit more, we're running around collecting bottles. Can you remember the day when you collected bottles? Because if you got, Bottles, you had currency. If you had currency, you could buy lollies, you know. And so we were running around collecting all the bottles and we put it in the crate and we'd go and cash it in for lollies, you know. I remember we had seagull races. Uh, you got to go way back for this, right? My dad's got about six or seven seagulls under his shed right now and he loves them, you know. And uh, so they would, we'd have a, you'd have an aluminium tinny boat and on the back, You'd have a seagull outboard and you stick your, your boy in it. And, you know, it was a race, you know. They were, they were good days, you know. I remember my mum's relationship with, um, with, with my father and my father's relationship with my mum. I sat analysing as I prepared the sermon. I cannot, in my 43 years of life, remember my dad yelling, at my mum once. Not once in his whole life did I ever see him uh, uh, speak badly to mum, get mad. I just didn't see it in his whole life. You know, he come from a very stable family too. I'm not saying we can all do this, right? But my father set an example for me, how to treat your wife. And uh, my mum and dad... Uh, what do you call it? It's called, uh, they're using it a lot in school terms now, uh, kinesthetic, you know? Uh, uh, when, you know when you've got two whales on a beach? They don't sit over there and over there. They all lean together and rub together. You know, they like to touch. You know, seals are like that, you know? Well, my mum and my dad, they'd like that, you know? And um, when I analyze how many nights my mum and my dad have been apart in their whole life, I think I can count five. And it was all one scout leader's training course in Timaru. And I remember Dad, I've got photos of it, Dad coming home on the plane. It was a really big deal. And, and that's the only time in, in my mum and dad's marriage that I can even find where they were apart for a night. And they're just... That was my mum and my dad. They are just, oh, they just close like this. And again, it set uh, an amazing example for me. I remember when I left school, um, I was an apprentice chef. I know that sounds like a joke now, but I was. I, I left school and I got a job as a chef and it was a disaster. I can't find stronger words. It was just a, a train wreck. And uh, I was never created to peel potatoes or cook steaks or stand in a restaurant 
go to work at two in the afternoon, get home at midnight and your boss is doing drugs and everyone's on the booze at all that time of the night and the environment is just terrible, you know. And I remember coming to a realization, I'm not cut out for this. This is a disaster for me at maybe 17, 18 years old. And I just uh, talked it over with my mum and dad. I said, I can't do it. i, I got to break this thing off. And they actually hadn't signed the apprenticeship papers, you know. And, uh, and my father he said, all right, do it. Do it. If it's just not you, do it. And he stepped me through that next transition period. And uh, within a day and a half, uh, dad and I, We'd, we'd walked, you know, we got down amongst all the garages and uh, God just stuck me in this garage changing oil and turned into an apprenticeship as a mechanic. It was perfect. It was just me all over, you know. But, you know, in the midst of that, Dad didn't say, you failed. Come on, stick it out, stick it out, you know. He fathered me through that quite, uh, it was quite traumatic, you know, dropping that job, moving on to that. And uh, he fathered me through that time. You know what I wrote here? Uh, he cheered me on in life. When it was time for, uh, for world missions, you know, and we start seeing us disappear on aeroplanes around this nation and that nation and getting married and going to another nation, taking kids, grandkids, by the way, and off to another whole bunch of sets of nations. Again, he cheered us on. Whatever we wanted to put our heart to, he said, I'll support you whatever you want to do. And again, it sparkled for him as a father to do it that way. And you know what? I wrote the closing statement on this. Growing up, I wanted to be just like him. And uh, I hope that has helped you today to reflect on fathering. Your fathering, your family's fathering. I'm also conscious today that fathering is very broken in many homes. And, uh, but it's God's idea. Fathering is God's idea. Uh, God calls himself God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit. It, it's a model. It's a model. God knew what he was doing. If your one was a little broken, it doesn't throw away the model for, for society. Society must uphold the model of fathering, family. It's God's idea. It's the ideal. Nothing will work better than this model. It's God's. It's God's model. Would you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6? You need to understand as we read these verses here, they are a vision. Okay? You got a man named Isaiah. God. I don't know whether he was asleep, whether he was sitting in the sun, but what we do know is God started speaking to Isaiah. Now you've got to understand, these are pictures, these are types. This is Isaiah's own story. After the vision come upon him, he wrote down what happened to him, and you and I enjoy it today. So look for the color, look for the taste in the story, look for the smells in the story, look to see the story come alive for you. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're reading from verses 1 down. In the year that King Uzziah died. You know why they put that there? That just gives you a date in history. That's why they write it there. So you go, well, was that in this date or that date? Right? Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. So he's getting this window. He's seeing what other people don't see. God's giving him a, a window Heavenly vision window, right? He says, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. That's talking about God's clothes, right? Above him were seraphs, those are angels, each with six wings, with two wings. They covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were flying, and they were calling to one another, who, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. You've got these angels, they're looking at God, and they're awestruck. Verse 4, 
at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds, that's the things around the door hold and the foundations, the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Isaiah says in verse 5, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. Another version has undone. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a coal in his hand which was taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for, paid for. Verse 8, Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Notice there's an us there. That's more than God the Father, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Us. Who, will, who can I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. And God says, go. And he goes on to say more things. Let's hold it at that point. When we read here in the early verses, okay, and, and, and it's talking about the thresholds shook and there was smoke. I didn't really understand the word power. We use it all the time. That's a powerful car. That's a powerful microwave. You know, But I did not understand the word power. And I've told you the story, but I'll tell it again for the new people here. When I was on Mercy Ships, we went to Vanuatu. And in Vanuatu, we parked at Tanner Island. Tanner Island, we went in. We got on the back of the police ute and they took us halfway up this mountain at midnight. At midnight, we got off. They said, this is dangerous. You could die doing this. We got off. Whole team, DTS team. I was leading it, probably responsible for the mess if it did happen. We walked up Tana Volcano. We got to the top maybe 45 minutes later and you look around and there's boulders everywhere and the guy goes, well, that one came out yesterday and that one came out last month. It's like, psh, plonk, you know, it can kill you doing what we were doing. And uh, if, if the parents of the DTS students knew, it could be bad, you know, if someone died, it was going to be bad. And the ground, just the whole time, the ground is just rumbling. And then all of a sudden, it would build up pressure or blockage, go, boosh, and it would go, Boom, in the sky, and it's black, and the sky is black, and there's just, there's just red shafts of lava going, whoosh, and, psh, and stuff. It wasn't coming near us, but it was powerful at the greatest level of power that I've ever seen. And if you want to measure God by anything, that's the only thing close that I can come to when it, when it says here, at the sound of the voices... You know, it's talking about the angels who are crying out about the power of God. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. And you know what? That, when I talk about power, that's the type of power that I'm, that I'm talking about here. It's talking about a majestic father. You know, we, we, we see so much stuff now and then we read it 2D on a page and it's not... It's not visual, and so we don't get it, you know? And so I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. In heaven, you've got these angels, and it's so powerful that even angels are covering their eyes that they don't want to see the power of God. The glare is so glaring that it says, with two wings, in verse 2, with two wings, they covered their eyes. You've got, a, you've got a scene going down. It's a vision. And, and you've got the scene in heaven. And it, it is a powerful scene. It's an awesome scene. And Isaiah's got this window into it. And uh, you know why it's so awesome? It's because you've got a view of a father. And he knows everything. And he's all powerful. 
and he's everywhere at once. Isaiah's getting to see this, this, this vision of a father who's generous, a father who's kind, a father who's caring. He can, he's seeing this window into heaven. He can see a father who's slow to anger, abounding in love. He's forgiving, restoring. Without him, nothing was made. Through him, everything was made. He's the, he's the father who's sustaining the whole world all at that moment in time. And Isaiah gets this window uh, to see it. I want to say this at this point in time. Fathers here, fathers who hear this sermon out of this place, you are a reflection. You are a reflection of everything I just said. That glory, that glory in heaven, all those characters I spoke about, God, you are on earth a reflection of that in your fathering. Your fathering is powerful as you represent and as you reflect for God. When people see you, they see the Father. You know, as we read these verses, something significant is going on. God is placing his hand on Isaiah's life. There's no two ways about it. He's coming to Isaiah and he's going, you, you're the one. You're the one I'm choosing. Yes, and Isaiah's going, man, someone else? No, you. God's saying, Isaiah, it's you I'm raising up. And you know what? I just want to say that there was a commissioning of Isaiah for a task. He was called to be a prophet, a speaking forth for God. And you know what? You folks as fathers here today, there's no less of a commissioning on your life. There's a commissioning on your life to father, and it's a powerful commissioning second to none. God was raising up Isaiah and commissioning him to go, and he's doing the same to you. It was, it was God setting him apart. I've just been to a pastor's conference with Darren last week for three days in Eastern Beach. Fletch, Graham Fletcher out of uh, British Columbia, he was the guest speaker. And um, he just hit the subject so hard that there was not room for doubt for anyone in the room. And the subject that he hit at so hard, he just hammered it home. It's year 2013 and you, they are not by accident and the place where you live. So Darren and I are going, 2013, Englewood, us, no accident. And there was just no one who could have been in that audience of pastors saying, I'm just not really meant to be in Pahia Tour in 2013, trying this little church. No, he's just going, commission, called by God, you, 2013, Courage, confidence, today you are called for this place at this time. And I want to say that to you, fathers. I just want to say to you, it's no accident in 2013, right here in Inglewood, that God's called you to fathering. There's just no coincidence in it. It is a planned commissioning of God on your life. Would you scan with me with your finger down to verse 5? Isaiah says, woe, woe is me, I cried, I am ruined, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You got a man here, and if you were to try and find a word that summarized those verses, it would be inadequate. Isaiah is feeling inadequate. He's feeling I'm not good enough. He's feeling undone. And if you've been a father for a while, I'll tell you, you're going to feel that feeling. I do. You do. I know you do. 
There is not a father on the face of the earth who doesn't have a day when he feels inadequate. Okay? It's just not true that you can be this fully confident father who gets everything right on every day. It doesn't work like that. There's days where your confidence is just low and you feel inadequate. But you know what? It's okay. I want you to know that in your fathering today, I speak it into your life. If you feel inadequate, it's okay. Darren was reading a, a book to the children this week, and it was talking about a builder who lost confidence. He said it was like 10 o'clock at night. The lady was coming back the next day, and he was trying to get a piece of wood to fit in this panel, and he'd go and cut another one, and he got the angle wrong, and then he'd go cut another one, and, and his confidence was just shot, you know? It's like that sometimes fathering, I'll tell you. Sometimes you, you just go and cut another way. You have another go and it's just not right and the angle's wrong and it's bent and you can't find the right piece of wood and, and you just feel inadequate. And then they turn the page in that book and he said, if you get like that, it can be in any part of your life, you just start slowly and gently again to build your courage. You know, the next day, he slowed it down. He went and got the right piece. He spent longer getting the mitre joint right on it. Ah, he got it right. You know, as fathering, there's never a time to give up. There's never a time that you've blown it too bad, that it's not time to take some courage again the next day. And it's okay to feel inadequate because Isaiah, he felt inadequate just the same. Would you read with me verse 6? Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth, and he said, This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. I notice that um, it's a supernatural process that's going on here. It's absurd to think that you would take a hot coal and push it against your lips, and the hot coal is sitting in tongs, which are being held by an angel, okay? It's not talking about a physical process. This is a supernatural vision, you know? This is God Almighty taking Isaiah, and he's saying, yeah, I know you feel inadequate. I know you feel guilty as a father, like if I transfer it into this sermon. I know you don't feel good enough, but it's got nothing to do with how good you are. Isn't that true as a father? It's got nothing to do with what you succeeded in, what you failed in, how good a father you are. It had nothing to do with Isaiah, how much he hadn't sinned, what a good man he was. There's a supernatural thing that goes on And God goes, shh, you're clean. You're done. It's taken away. Your sin is taken away. And he goes, but, 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 I didn't pay for it. It was free. I did it. I took it away. You know, and as a father, it's like that. I just want you to understand, God wants to set you apart as a father, and he's not one bit interested how good you are or how adequate that you feel because it's not about that. It's about that there's a calling from God and it's on your life in 2013, the 1st of September, Inglewood, Taranaki. There's a call on your life to father. He didn't ask you how you felt if you're good enough. He said it's a supernatural call. I set you apart. Chosen, you. But, 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 no. Chosen, you. I take it to my own pastoring sometimes. Sometimes I think, ah, I'm so useless. And God goes, chosen, you. I didn't choose you because you're the best. Yeah? Fathers, today. He didn't choose you because you're the best. He chose you because he chose you. You can't say to God, why didn't you choose somebody else? It's his game. He wants to play the game and say, it's free. 
It's a gift. And he turns the whole line around and puts the, the fast people at the back. He'll just do it. He'll do it the way he wants. I was listening to a song this week. It was by Jimmy Needham. Now, Josie said, oh, I know that song and it's called this. So I go to the internet and I get it and I look for the lyrics. And I want, to, I want you to look in the song as I read this uh, verse or so. I want you to look for what is success. And Jimmy Needham, he's an artist and he stands and sometimes there's small audiences and sometimes there's vast audiences. And you can hear what's going on in his heart as he speaks about this. He writes this. This is a song, right? but I'm reading the song. Why are we so convinced a bigger audience is simply common sense to have? Maybe success is measured by nothing less than obedience. So if I'm destined for a small stage, the small crowds and the small pay, then maybe even in a small way, I can bring you fame. As I listen to this, just the word, maybe success is measured in obedience. And you know, as we father our children, as we father other people's children, maybe success in life is not measured in this or that or this or that or big or great. Maybe success in life is measured in obedience. Maybe at the end of our lives, we're going to go, wow, I never knew that when you prompted me to do that as a father, wow. You think of my own father. Do you, if he knew that putting that motor together for me and bringing it back from Fletcher Wood Panels would have done what it had done today for me, man, he would have done it a thousand times. But it was just probably a prompting. And he said, yeah, you know, there's things that you've done for your children, for other people's children that you father. And it's just a prompting, and you do it. And I, the whole point of this is maybe success, maybe, is measured in obedience. Run your finger down to verse 8. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying to me, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Fathers, can you hear it today? Can you hear that same voice? God is saying to you today in this service, whom shall I send to Father? Who will go for me? Who will go for us? God is saying to you today. And I ask you, will you represent the Father? Will you be his mirror? Will you reflect? some of that glory into the people that you come in contact with. And uh, we started in Ephesians 6 verse 4, and I want to just say it again. Fathers, you are called to bring them up in, in, the, in the ways of the Lord, to train them up, to instruct them up. I want to finish with a joke. Um. I was uh, looking up stuff on fathering, and it said this. It's a man called Jim Bishop, and he's describing, he's describing what it's like to give his daughters away in marriage. It reads like this. Jim Bishop describes the feeling of a father. A feel, i got to start again. Jim Bishop describes the feeling a father had when his daughter became engaged. This is the third of four daughters. Every time it happens, I'm obsessed with the feeling that I'm giving a million-dollar Stradivarius to a gorilla. <laughs> Isn't that so true? As fathers, we're so protective. I want to read a couple more things here. There's a Spanish story of a father and a son who became estranged. They got separated, right? The son ran away, and the father set off to find him. He searched for months, but to no avail. In a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 
800 Pakas showed up looking for forgiveness and the love of their fathers. Wow. Always good to make it practical in a sermon. I'm going to finish uh, telling you, uh, just giving you some ideas of ways that you can impact others with your fathering. You could be a mentor to a boy without a father through a big brother or some other agency like that. You could contact the, the local school and become a tutor for a needy child in your fathering. You could teach a Sunday school. You could adopt a child or foster uh, somebody. You could meet weekly uh, uh, with, uh, with a child from the neighborhood who doesn't have a home. You could just teach him to weld in your shed. You, become, you could become a scout leader or a cub leader. You could coach a sports team. You could uh, volunteer uh, uh, in some type of ministry like that. You could, uh, if you're a business owner, you could hire a child or a young man who no one else would even touch, you know, and, and face the consequences and step him through that in life, an at-risk child. Uh, you could be involved in youth leadership. Um, you could be involved in, uh, in a sports team. And you could go to a, a local prison, which would be Wanganui, and, uh, and run a, a Bible school amongst juveniles, you know, or, or just go in there on a regular basis. So. Father, as we, as we close off today, um, help us sense the awesome calling of fathering. Help us to go forth from this place with a new, uh, a new power, a new view of heaven, of how great you are and what a reflection we are of you here on earth. And uh, we ask this in the name of Jesus. And uh, lift the inadequate feelings of fathering and empower us to make a difference that in uh, 40, 50, 60 years from now, our story will be the story told in the prophets. And, and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast of Inglewood Christian Fellowship in Taranaki, New Zealand. Call by and listen in again next week. God bless. Bye-bye.